Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and you enjoy what you are hearing, please tap that subscribe button and set your notification bell to all so you don't miss every time I upload, which happens to be daily. If you would like to learn how to become a member or tip me with a cup of coffee, that information can be discovered in the description box below. With all of that being said, it is now time to go back to ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Crazy X's. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Oh, and by the way, if you happen to hear jingling in the background, it is my youngest cat. She wants to be under daddy's feet. So <laughs> I apologize, but I think we'll be all right. Let's get started. I'm not a creative writer or anything. I just thought I'll put this story on here for you all to read because it was pretty creepy to me. When I was about 13, I had not long broken up with this girl who supposedly had a psycho family. One of the girl's family was a close friend who was supposedly obsessed with her. I was invited out with my friends after school one day and this boy latched on. Everybody told me to come out and that he wanted to make amends and he understood why I did what I did, etc., etc. Being the pushover that I am, I went out and we hung out in parks and smoked and drank. As it started to get dark, I decided to go home. I felt uneasy being around him and he started acting all weird, talking about fights he had been in and bragging about bashing some guy's face in with his fist at school. Because of this, I left. I didn't feel safe whatsoever. The next day, my best friend and all the other kids that were out that night came into school and told me that gotten worse after I left. Apparently, after they had drank some more, he started waving this huge kitchen knife around and was telling everybody how he was going to stab me in the stomach for breaking that girl's heart. Let me point out, I only know details of this because I have a relative in the local police force. My dad made us move because he knew where I lived. I continued getting death threats on social media, though. Until about a year or two later, when it was in the paper and was spread around the town, that he had broke into somebody's house and stabbed a man to death, and then slit his wrists in the man's bathtub. They found high amounts of cocaine and cannabis in his system, along with a ton of alcohol. The elderly neighbors phoned the police when they heard some commotion, and they hadn't seen the man leave for work. They found him barely conscious, and he is now in a psych ward. This was supposedly over the girl again. I think, no, I know, I dodged a bullet there. I'll start with some brief context. I had lived with an abusive male partner who didn't value my safety whatsoever. He got really mad if I didn't leave the door unlocked. And we lived in a not so great part of town. He was way older than me. I was barely 18 at the time and he was 26. Neither of us owned a car. He worked at Waffle House and I was getting sick constantly. So keeping a job wasn't easy for me. He liked drugs and alcohol, and he traumatized me in regards to both. Blamed me for his usage and would assault me while high on these drugs. Fun fact, he said if I reported his conduct, he would blame me because he was the one on the substance, even though he held me down and forced it on me. I digress. When I finally got the courage to leave for the last time, I did it while he was at work. I begged my mama to help me get my necessities, you know, like stuff with emotional value and some clothes. Instead, she called the cops. There was a warrant for his arrest, and she got a police escort just in case. 
As soon as he got out, he immediately started messaging me from different new numbers threatening to murder me and my family if I didn't go home with him. It didn't matter how much. I just blocked him. He kept at it. I was scared, but I thought for the most part I was safe. After all, he didn't have a car. I was wrong. About a week into this, he and his gun-owning friend showed up. He banged on the door and was screaming. His friend, owning a gun, is important because he repeatedly said that he and his friend would shoot us. My window was on the second floor facing the street, and my stomach dropped when he saw me. I immediately dropped and army crawled into my little brother's room and hid in the closet. His window faced the backyard. I guess my monkey brain felt safer there. I was the only one home and scared that if I breathed too loud, he would hear me. I was terrified. I didn't want to call the police because my dumbass thought he'd hear that too. I silently texted my mom. Police arrived about 20 minutes after my mom said that they were on their way. He and his friend were taken into custody after the same friend had gotten him out on bond. His friend did have a gun. He didn't. Bottom line, I was able to get a restraining order. I'm strictly sober and definitely in therapy after all of that. This happened about a year ago. I'm 16 now, and he's going to be 20 in August. We met through the internet. It turned out he lived in a city right next to my village. I was 12 then. He was 16. We quickly lost contact. After two years, I texted him again, because my friends edited a photo of him and dared me to send it. He seemed nice. We had a lot of shared interests, and talking with him felt pretty natural. I was used to age differences because, for some reason, I never meet people my age, so I didn't mind it. He took the bus to my village a couple of times, and we hit it off pretty well. He even met my best friend. Then, I heard he had a Skype call with one of my online friends, specifically, that he told her how his last girlfriend supposedly killed herself because of him, because of the horrible things he said to her. My friend felt like he was beginning to crush on her, maybe because she was nice and all too kind. The other friend voiced her worry over him, turning her into his ex. She was understandably grossed out. My friends talked with him about it, and I asked why he told them, but not me. He said I was too immature to understand. I was upset. I was the person who introduced him to my friend group, and he was now trying to forcefully cut me out of it. My friends had enough and cut him out instead. I didn't. I felt really bad for him. He was an orphan. He lived alone, had issues with alcohol, and had a lot of trouble with depression. Losing three people could have been devastating, so I kept messaging him, maybe out of pity. He turned very, very creepy very fast though suddenly he called me darling i was over the moon because i caught feelings a little puppy crush on someone i knew i could never date but who gave me hope that maybe just maybe i could he spent more time with me sent me pictures and videos of him going on about his day nothing too unusual until one time, we called while I was busy playing a game on my laptop. I don't remember what was said exactly, but I remember him being very excited that 15 is the legal age in Poland. I was excited too. I don't know why. I remember being very, very stiff, even though this was just a harmless phone conversation. The joke was, until February because I would turn 15 then. He was supposed to visit. I felt like I owed him everything, just because he had issues with his mental health. He told me that his psychiatrist said she had never met someone so young 
that has lived through so much, even though our conversation wasn't about depression at all. I felt so bad for him. That's why I never said anything about things he did that creeped me out or made me feel unsafe, because I was afraid he'd feel worse and do something to himself. He told me he tried to kill himself a few times, so what if I was the reason he'd tried again? He already told me all about his issues of loneliness and abandonment. When he visited, I learned he still had feelings for his supposedly dead ex-girlfriend. He played a song that was their song. Every word in it described their relationship. While we were in my room, he was close to crying, but I had no idea what to do. He put me in the situation even though he knew I wasn't equipped to deal with it. Once. When I was upset, I told him I don't want to be cheered up. I just didn't. I wanted to be alone. So he sent me tens of thousands of texts, pictures, and cheap cheer up LOL things. He found on his phone. It was the one time I set some sort of boundary, and he broke it immediately with a cop story too late message following. I had a school trip in October and I had a good time, from what I remember. But, for some reason, I just lost all of my feelings for him, then and there. Maybe because, for once, I didn't force myself to feel bad for him and constantly check if he's online, wants to talk, or if something happened. Maybe because all of my friends thought we were going to date, and it was really unnerving that they didn't see anything wrong with it. I cut contact with him later, very, very slowly. I deleted him off of things he never checks, blocked his number, then blocked him on Facebook. He noticed. I never looked back. Later on, through yet another friend, the only one that kept contact with him, I learned that his ex wasn't dead, or maybe she was. There was screenshots of him talking with a family member about the funeral, then screenshots of him talking about moving in with a girl two years older than he was, who's the love of his life, who had the same name as his ex. He sent me a picture that was supposed to prove that he was in a psych ward, but even my friend refused to believe him. I don't even know what he was lying about in the end, or if he was lying at all. Next school year, I'll be going to a school in the city he lives in, and I know he is still there. I used to work at Borders way back when, though I had another job at the mall. Something about being at the bookstore made me much more recognizable, I guess. I often had people approach me when I was on the street or ask me about the store's sales, etc. while I was at a drive through window. It was mostly harmless stuff, though I got some creeps on occasion. At the time, I had a dating profile up but I had to take it down because I'd started getting weird messages from men saying they saw me at the grocery store or something and wanted to touch themselves. Just bizarre shit. The killing blow that made me finally close it, however, came shortly before my 19th birthday. I was checking my account after work, and I see a message titled, We Met, which immediately creeped me out. I clicked on it, and it said, sort of, before proceeding to go into this very weird graphic depiction of this guy who was apparently so thrilled by my cashiering skills that I caused a stirring in his loins. This email was seriously like three pages long, talking about how sexually excited he was and all of the things he could do to my young body. I was horrified to think that one of my customers had been looking at me like that, thinking those things. I clicked on his profile. No photo. He said he was 56 and single, but no other information. I needed to know what he looked like, which is the only reason I replied, and I imagine that was his game all along. 
I didn't respond to any of the other stuff he said, but I asked him if he'd send me a photo. He told me that he couldn't put one up because he's sort of a public figure, but he told me he'd email it to me. It took him two days to get back to me. Those were two very long days. While I waited, I looked at my message history and discovered that this guy had actually written me many times. I'd ignored him because, one, no pictures, and two, way out of my age group I was looking for. Out of morbid curiosity, I looked at the messages. All of them were filled with sexually graphic things he wanted to do to me. He talked about fantasies of using me with another man that he knew, acting out sexual assault scenes, tying me up, etc. Some of the details were specific to me, which leads me to believe he wasn't just sending them en masse to every young woman on the site. Meanwhile, this guy is older than my dad. I spent the next two days tensing around every older guy who came in. I was afraid to be friendly to any of them for fear that one of them would be this guy and he'd take it as a go ahead to come at me. I was having a birthday celebration the day he finally got back to me. The moment I saw his name, I got a bad feeling in my gut. I couldn't immediately place it, but I knew there was something wrong with this person writing things to me. I stared at it for a moment positive I knew this guy, but my brain would not let it click. I texted my friend to confirm with her as it began to dawn on me. This man was my high school principal. I was horrified. I was still 18 at the time, which means that he must have been creeping on a bunch of us all along. I remember being alone with him in his office, and it makes me feel queasy. Is he just perched and waiting for girls to graduate so he can legally pounce? I wrote him back and told him, I don't know if you remember me, but you are my high school principal, and I happen to know that you are married. He didn't reply, and I thought that was the end of it. I was still super creeped out for a while after that, though. So. Just knowing how long he'd been thinking about me and sending me these graphic messages when he'd been an authority figure in my formative years. Almost a year passed without incident, and he didn't come in when I was there. But one day, I started ringing someone up without getting a good look at his face. It was a friendly exchange, right up until I made eye contact. It was him again, and... He was grinning at me. I put his stuff in his bag and turned away from the register, but he stayed where he was. I pretended to organize some returns, but he just kept standing there, silently, not moving or anything. I knew he was watching me, but I didn't want to look. The moment lasted for too long, so I finally grabbed my headset and asked a manager to come to the front of the store. He hurried out after that, and I never saw him again. Oh yeah, quick edit. I was going to mention this before, but the post was already too long. Because this has been a common question, though, it turns out he had recently retired, so he no longer worked with children. Regardless, I still contemplated putting the information out there, but I realized there wasn't a whole lot I could really do at that point. Technically, he wasn't committing any crimes, just describing kinky fantasies to a legal adult. I thought about it for a long time, discussed it with people in my life, including a parent who worked with the school, and it just did not seem worth the risk. It was a smaller area, and I didn't know what might happen to me. Now, I probably would have done something anyway, but I was a kid at the time. As for his wife, again, I thought about contacting her. My friend's mom knew her, and I had email evidence. However, he only ever sent his photo through an identifiable account, and I'd learned from a friend's experience years 
prior that it was risky to get involved in marital affairs. I didn't know their situation, and there was a chance his wife might have already suspected his infidelity, but remained in denial because she didn't want her marriage to end. In those situations, sometimes the woman will lash out at her husband's victims because she can't lash out at her husband. My mom and several other older women told me not to get involved too, so I didn't. Again, that might not have been the right move, but even today, I'm not sure what it was. Oh yeah, and edit too. To be clear, this was over a decade ago. I do still have the final email somewhere, but I'm not sure if I have the ones he sent me on the dating site. They may have just been connected to the account, possibly lost when I deleted it. I think I may have screenshotted them, but that was like four computers ago, so I can't be sure now. I no longer live in that area, and frankly, I feel like it's more likely to invite unwelcome attention onto me than onto him. He could be dead now for all I know. I lived in a van and traveled the country working seasonal jobs. When I would get somewhere new, I used to use Tinder to meet new friends. Anyways, I was in Auburn, Washington area and had a few drinks at the bar, hoping to meet some locals. When I left the bar, it was dark already. I was walking to my van when I heard somebody say my first and then full name. Miss Red Flag. I live like six states over. Nobody but that guy who checked my ID at the bar would have known my last name. I turned around and saw the guy sitting on some bricks smoking a cigarette. I say, yeah, that's me, without thinking. He said, oh, oh, hi, my name's Chris. We matched on Tinder. I stood with him and we talked. He said he lived right there, pointing to the door behind the bar that leads to the studios on the second story. We hung out and had a drink or two. He invited me up for dinner cooked it in the community kitchen. I wasn't planning on going into his place, but I was talking about Magic the Gathering, and he said he had some cards and was wondering if I wanted to check them out. I agreed. His studio was literally the size of a closet and had a bed in it and a fridge. There was a little nook in the corner that had a shower and toilet. It was less than a 100 square feet, I swear on that one. I looked through his cards and told him nothing I was interested in. He said he figures because they were given to him and he does not play. The next day, I go to the local game store to play Magic the Gathering. Guess who walks in? He offers to get drinks and I decline. I tell him I will add him on Facebook and message him if I change my mind. He gives me his name and looks over my shoulder while I type it into the app. His face pops up and I tap on his profile. Then I see it. 500 mutual friends. I don't live anywhere near here. I have been here three days. Then I think, oh, I am friends with a lot of drag performers on Facebook. Maybe he is too. I add him and leave. Once in my van, I get on Tinder for the first time since getting there. I swipe and I swipe and I swipe. I pay the $5, I get more swipes. I swipe and I swipe and I swipe. I don't see him. Where is he? This crisp guy. Two hours later, I find him. I open his profile. 500 mutual friends. I swiped right. Nothing happens. It doesn't say, you've got a match. Not only have we never matched, but he didn't even swipe on me. Was he trying to hide the profile? I felt like I kept seeing him that week. I didn't want it to cause me to change travel plans and leave early, but 
it started to really freak me out. He showed up at the bar that I was at or the game store when I was there, even though he told me he didn't play magic. I started to get really uneasy, so I checked his Facebook profile once more. All of the mutual friends were my close friends, my childhood friends, my family, my teachers, my co-workers. I couldn't handle it anymore and changed my entire winter plans just to get out of the situation. So Chris, I hope I never meet you again. Oh, and this may be unrelated. Three weeks later, I read in the news that his apartment and the bar where we had met had burned down. In 2016, my cousin Anna met a man named Jonathan. They were extremely happy together, to the point that, in 2018, they got engaged. Anna, however, cheated on Jonathan shortly after with a man named Link. This was poorly solved by an idea to have a polyamorous relationship with Link. As time went on, Link turned into a horrific housemate and boyfriend. So, Anna and Jonathan decided it was time to remove him. This proved extremely difficult. Anna started by asking him to leave, and it didn't work. He refused to go. The landlord also refused to evict him due to him doing no wrong. They decided he needed a reason to leave, and I was tasked with removing him. I'm a complete pacifist, but I am also 6'4", and scared the fuck out of him. I told him to leave, and after I had a short conversation with the landlord, who had called, he was forced to leave via eviction notice. After he was kicked out, he revealed that he was only there for Anna. I know, shocking, right? And that he would revive the relationship. This was accomplished in a weird way. He was stalking her constantly, following her home from work, standing at her car when she went into a store, just being all around creepy. That was not only bound to her, though. He followed everyone else in the house, and he would even keep tabs on me. I saw him watching me in the school parking lot, and we decided things needed and had to change immediately. One night, I visited them and told them about that event, and Anna decided enough was enough. She called Link and told him to fuck off, and we would call the cops if she saw him again. We all went to sleep and thought that would be the end of it. Oh, boy, were we wrong. It was exactly 7 in the morning, and I was woken up to what sounded like thunder over and over again. The entire house was shaking. He was at the front door, punching it, trying to get in. Because he was going crazy. I had carried a gun to their house the night before, just in case of a situation like this. And I yelled, Hey, I'm willing to kill you if you are willing to die. He took this notice seriously, and the cops were angry at me for threatening him, but due to the circumstances, they let me go. I was there a month later, and I was having a good time with them, playing video games, beating Jonathan's ass in Mortal Kombat, as I do, and then I saw him looking at me through the window, and I freaked out. It was like a big-ass spider crawling up your arm. He bolted the moment I saw him, and I couldn't sleep that night. A few nights ago, I visited again and woke up in the middle of the night. I wanted a glass of chocolate milk and an ibuprofen as my head was hurting, and I need to sleep. So I went to the kitchen, and he was there. He had a big knife in his right hand. I remember freezing and looking at him. His pupils looked dilated, and he freaked me the hell out. He said, to tonic, it's not what it looks like. I'm here to stab Jonathan in the face. I just love her so much, 
and everything was fine before she intervened. I ended up attacking him and got the knife away before he ran. When the police finally caught him, they informed us that they would hold him for a bit and give him a warning, but technically it was still his house as he was never evicted and that we needed a restraining order to keep him away. Why are you writing this now, you might ask? Well, it's the only way I can sleep, to write about my experiences. Hopefully, he will slip up and get arrested or something. But as long as he's around, I'm having trouble sleeping, and I'm scared for everyone I care about. Life. To begin this, this started when I was 14. I'm 21 now. I just transferred to a new high school in the middle of the school year as a freshman with my twin sister. I was enrolled into a Spanish 2 class where I met Tony, and that's where this obsession began. But when I started my class and met Tony, I instantly thought he was attractive. He was tall brown hair and beautiful eyes for a guy, and was also a year my senior. But I did notice he was extremely shy and kind of awkward, but I made up excuses to talk to him, asking him about the homework and other meaningless small talk. He took to me and asked if I wanted to walk around during lunch and talk. I happily agreed. He was obviously not very confident and didn't know how to initiate conversation. So I did most of the talking, even went as far for asking him for his phone number. After a few days of texting and talking, I can tell he doesn't have any friends and he is kind of negative and has a pessimistic view towards life. It was rather draining and disappointing. Things he would say were kind of unsettling, or I guess just unusual for me. He would text me fantasizing about being a superhero, kind of like role play, in which I was the damsel in distress that he was my savior, and text me somewhat similar to those. Choose your own adventure, always ending in the damsel and the hero kissing and being together. He had an obsession with Slasher from the Scream movies. Overall, he was a nice guy, but different from what I was expecting or attracted to. Time passes. Valentine's Day is coming up. We're talking practically every day, so he asked me to be his Valentine. I agree, somewhat reluctantly. So, it's Valentine's Day. He walks up to me and gives me a pack of Hershey Kisses and some Twizzlers. I hate Twizzlers. So I handed them back to him, gave him a kiss on the cheek, and went to my class. Yes, I know that was kind of a bitch move, but I was honestly losing interest in him at that point. And I told him before, I didn't like red vines or any candy like that. During the day, I received more gifts, flowers, and candy from others, friends, and I see Tony, and I can tell he's extremely upset by this, but he doesn't say anything. He texts me later in the day, saying how stupid he felt and how he was outdone by everybody else. I just didn't respond. Over the next few weeks, I gradually talked to him less and less. Class is awkward and I can tell he wants to say something to me, but never does. I later learned from my twin sister that he asks her every single day about me, if I'm talking to someone else, if I like him, how to win me over, confiding in her that he has never even talked to a girl before. And at first, I think it's sweet, but I still no longer have a romantic interest in him. We would talk at school sometimes, he would bring me homemade cookies, walk me to the train station, still text and try to call me in the evenings after school. But I was talking to someone new who eventually became my boyfriend for the rest of the high school year, Brandon. 
When I started dating Brandon, I knew that Tony was absolutely devastated. He then started telling people around school that I was his first kiss. I was confused because I didn't know a kiss on the cheek counted as a first kiss, but to each their own. It was somewhat upsetting because people were getting the impression that we dated or that I played him, which was not the case at all. I would still talk to Tony as a friend. He was in the same grade and classes as my new boyfriend, and he would always tell me how he thought Brandon didn't like him and that he felt like Brandon knew about us. I told Tony there was nothing to know about us because we weren't anything but friends. And Brandon was totally chill, non-confrontational, stoner type, not in his nature to stir up drama over anything, and definitely not the jealous type. The school year was coming to an end, and Tony comes running up to me after the last day of school and hands me this. I shit you not. 60 or 70 page notebook, wide rolled if it makes a difference, explaining all the ways he's in love with me and how everybody at the school thinks poorly of me and how he can treat me better, blah, blah, blah. I read it once, showed my twin, and she tells me how weird and uncomfortable it makes her. We both agree on that. I stash it away and don't speak of it to anybody. I act like nothing happened, and I still talk to him as a friend occasionally. I worked a lot in high school in my free time and spent a lot of time with my boyfriend and friends and didn't think much about Tony. Time does go on. We eventually stop talking. I see him around school, and he never really is with anybody else. He's always usually alone which I don't find strange anymore considering how awkward and quiet he can be. Fast forward another year. I'm a junior. Tony and Brandon are both seniors, getting ready to graduate. Tony texts me out of the blue one day and tells me he has written a book and it could mean the world to him if I could be the first one to read it and give him feedback. And being the person I am, I agree. So he comes up to me at school the next day and hands me this fat notebook and tells me to take my time reading it and to give him honest feedback when I was finished. I read this story in four class periods. It was around 300 pages long. Anyway, the story takes place in a Game of Thrones era or setting. The three main characters are Eric, Tony, Ava, me, and Isaac. Brandon, for the sake of confusion. I'll be referring to the characters by our names. The only reason I know the characters were us and not fictional was simply by the way he had described them, literally identical to our physical appearance. To continue, Tony was the son of the king or whatever. The rest of us were mere peasants, but Tony was always in love with me and I was with Brandon. It was the annual time where our kingdom would go to battle with another for honor and glory, gladiator style. Tony thought it would be a wonderful time to prove himself and volunteered. The night before our kingdom traveled to where the battle would take place, my character went to Tony in the middle of the night to express her love and fear, and they ended up having very graphic sex. It was truly disturbing. The next day, after they had arrived at the place of battle, my character went to his room again, where the same graphic encounter occurred again. And during this, Brandon came looking for my character in which we were caught. My character told Tony I didn't really love him and ran away with Brandon to apologize for being a harlot. Tony was devastated and ultimately let his opponent kill him in battle because he couldn't handle the loss of the love of his life. Our kingdom goes back home, and in the middle of the night, Brandon sneaks through my window and murders me. He slit my throat. The end. As you can imagine, I was 
absolutely horrified and creeped out. I threw the book away and never told Tony what I thought about it. He must have known because he never asked for it back. Tony and Brandon both graduate. Life goes on. Tony didn't try to reach out to me for a few years until I was around 20. He messaged me on Instagram in the middle of the night. Show your feet. Submit to daddy. I always look at your feet at school and would fantasize about them. Along the links to a few foot fetish websites, I promptly blocked him. The next day, he messaged me from another account, a foot and fetish and bondage account he ran. He asked me why I blocked him. I blocked him again. Earlier, last year, on my new account, he messaged me basically calling me a whore and how he wishes I would just die and how he hated everyone he went to school with and hoped they would all die and how he fantasized on how he would kill me for all the pain I caused him. I was genuinely afraid and I didn't know how to handle the situation. Was it really a death threat? I don't know. I later learned that he worked at a diner down the street from my apartment. I avoided it at all costs. I since moved and haven't heard from Tony since, but multiple girls I went to high school with told me he was obsessed with me and would constantly talk about me to them and how he would message them the same disgusting things while he was on a drunken stupor. Anyways, Tony, I hope I never meet your crazy ass again. So I matched with this girl on Tinder, Jenna. Jenna and I, we went on our first date on January 26. She knew I was out of a long-term relationship and still maintained occasional contact with my ex, Mary. Jenna and I officially started calling each other boyfriend and girlfriend around mid-February. Three days ago, while I'm in the shower, she goes through my phone and reads old messages between Mary and I a few casual ones, and a few very affectionate ones from before Jenna and I started seeing each other, or even met. Jenna packs all of her things and is heading out of the door when I get out of the shower. With my phone, she texts a bunch of people saying things like, I'm an asshole, and Mary is a manipulative bitch. She hacks into my Facebook and makes a post calling Mary a whole slew of names and blocks and unfriends several of my friends. She does a similar thing with Twitter. I got a hold of a co-worker's phone and used it to try and contact her and sign back into my Facebook. Once she realizes I did this, she changed my passwords and my email passwords as well. Eventually, she tells me she wants to talk this out and to meet at my place. I play along so I can get my phone and passwords back. She gives me my phone and makes me call Mary and tell her I'm cutting her out of my life. I got a hold of Mary earlier and warned her something like this might happen. We both have a background in theater, so we had a very convincing argument over speakerphone so Jenna can hear. Jenna gives me my passwords, and I immediately change them. I tell her she should leave, and she doesn't understand why I want her out of my life. She goes home, very upset, about me breaking up with her over all of this. Jenna starts posting and commenting on Facebook, and I block her. I blocked her on everything, and she begins calling me over and over not saying anything when I try to pick up the phone. I block her number. I start receiving the same calls over and over from a Colorado number. I live in Canada, by the way. Eventually, I go to my phone provider and change my number. 
I also changed the locks on my door in case she took the key. The next day, she makes a Facebook page calling me a piece of shit and Mary a manipulative C-word, I can't say it, and she hacks into my alt Twitter account. I tell her if she calls me one more time or posts one more thing about anybody I know, I'm calling the police. I get an email saying that my application for a credit card with a bank I do not use has been approved. I call the bank and tell them what's happening and they put a freeze on the account. Several friends have told me to call the police and I finally realize enough is enough. The police come and tell me that she has some sort of file with them and that her name isn't even Jenna. It's something totally different. They issue a warning of harassment and if she tries to contact me again, I call the police and she gets arrested. On Monday, I have to call the fraud people and get all of my accounts frozen and investigated and stuff. I realize this is a lot, but this is actually a pretty bare bones version of this story because the reason I'm posting this is now that the police got involved and I have had my locks changed and my number changed and all is solved. I'm starting to feel the emotional damage of being abused and harassed by somebody I was really starting to care about and I didn't know how to deal with. So, Jenna, or whatever your name is, I hope we never meet again. When I was 23, I was renting my first place when my ex-girlfriend from way back reached out to me. We had dated for X amount of months in high school. It's been over 10 years since high school, and I still can't remember how long it was. It just went badly because I was a douche and started talking to another girl. Anyway, my ex said she was over what happened when we were teenagers and was willing to give it another shot. So we have a date and then several dates and things are doing really well. A month into our relationship, one night I'm at work on a late shift and she calls me saying that she has gotten into an argument with her mother. They had gotten into some sort of domestic about something she got slapped and needed to cool off at my place. I get home and turns out she was moving in. I'm pretty laid back and wanted help with the rent anyway, so I'm somewhat okay with it. I mean, I knew I was walking into a snake pit, but I didn't know I was going into a viper pit. So we lived together for a whopping two months when things take a turn. She starts telling me she's insecure about me talking to other girls, then that changes to watching porn as well, which didn't work. I have control issues. We start fighting a lot, sometimes all night long. She starts cutting herself, saying it was my fault, ends up getting tetanus, late phone calls, asking where I am at work and who I'm with. I worked late hours at an ambulance service. Things come to a head one night when Crazy X tries to tell me looking at porn is the same as beating her. She starts screaming at me, bringing up all the cutting and the doctor visits, claiming it's my fault. I get fed up and tell her to move out. This pushes her off the deep end, grabs my handgun that I keep for self-defense, tells me that she'll kill me then herself. I called the police. She leaves shortly afterwards. After she throws my loaded handgun outside, I think, yay, it's over. But it wasn't yet. So a few days go by without incident. Crazy X texts me saying she needs to give me her house key. I tell her no and to throw it away, but she drives to my house anyway, leaves the key and tapes a note to my door. 
saying I'm mentally ill and need help, and she forgives me, blah, blah, blah. I stopped reading after the I need help part, and she keeps texting and texting, asking if I read it, even going as far as blaming her behavior on pregnancy, saying that the baby is mine but she had lost it due to the stress I put her under. So here I am, years down the road, married with a wonderful two-year-old hellion, <laughs> with no regrets of leaving the crazy ex. Let's not ever meet again, you crazy bitch. And that, dear listeners, brings it close to true crazy exes. Before I move on any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes and the gifted memberships. Patty's niece, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S., Tina Mee, Luz Crispin, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, Sugar Spite, Mrs. Innerscare, and Anita V. Thank you all so much for continuing to be the support columns that holds this channel up. I couldn't love you anymore. <laughs> and our gifted memberships, the Conspiracy Archives, Grimm's Library, Adam Grigg, Nat Davies, and the Cryptid Sleeps. Thank you all so much. I hope you're enjoying your time here. And to the other subscribers or people who just watched the video, thank you so much for your support. For without you... I would not have a voice. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these selections. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.